are you trying to tell me that this knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket, someone picked it up off the street, went to the boy's house, and stabbed his father with it just to test its sharpness? No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife, and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. It's just possible. Take a look at this knife. It's a very unusual knife. I've never seen one like it. Neither had the storekeeper who sold it to the boy. Aren't you asking us to accept a pretty incredible coincidence? I'm just saying a coincidence is possible. And I say it's not possible. Where did that come from? It's the same knife. You think you're doing? Where did you get it? I went out walking for a couple of hours last night. I walked through the boys' neighborhood. I bought that in a little pawn shop just two blocks from the boys' house. It cost six dollars. It's against the law to buy or sell switchblade knives. That's right, I broke the law. Listen, you pulled a real bright trick. Now, supposing you tell me what it proves. Maybe there are ten knives like that, so what? Maybe there are. Well, what does it mean? You found another knife like it. What's that, the discovery of the age or something? You mean you're asking us to believe that somebody else did the stabbing with exactly the same kind of knife? The odds are a million to one. It's possible, but not very probable. We're friends, Harvey. We go as far back as when you were a fresh kid congressman, don't we? Why is it that everything you say sounds like a threat? Maybe it's a mannerism, because I don't threaten friends. But why furnish your enemies with ammunition? You're a family man, Harvey, and someday, God willing, you may want to be president. And here you are, out in the open, where any hep person knows that this one is toting that one around for you. Are we kids or what? Next time you come up, you might join me on my TV show. Thanks, J.J. For what I consider sound advice. Go thou and sin no more. Come on, let's go. Go where? Pineville, let's head for Pineville. Pineville South, I don't go South. I should know a girl in Pineville. If she's still there, we get this broke out. Come on. And then what? I'm a strange colored man in a white South town. How long do you think before they pick me up? Get off my back. I ain't married to you. Now, what do I care? Come on. You married to me, all right, Joker. And here's the ring. But I ain't going south on no honeymoon now. We going north. Through the swamp? We go round it. Used to work a turpentine mill about 60 miles north of here. Here's a train. Come to pick up the turpentine every day. Come out of the west end of the swamp, heading across the line to the paint makers up north in Ohio. Now, we try for that train. Mm-hmm. How long you been in jail? Eight years. Then how do you know the train's still running? I don't know. You don't know? You asking me to go 60 miles with you and you don't even know? What are you inviting me on? A long walk off a short pier and I'm gonna come up with a wet head? Nothing doing. Now, come on. Come on, damn you. Come on. <laughs> you chowdered potatoes, huh? Yeah. You gonna dance down the street with a gal on one arm yeah. and this on the other? Shut up. I mean, you gonna grab a boat to Rio, pull yeah. in your own anchor? We can get this broke. What you gonna do? Bite it through with your teeth? Maybe your head hard enough. Time's gonna come, Joe. The time's gonna come. But if you want it to be right here, right now, that's okay with me. You kind of got the advantage of me, boy. You're awful tough to see if the line ain't good. But you can hear me, Joker, so listen good. Either we go north together or together, we're gonna go them 10 miles right back onto Dead Street. You lied to them? Yes. And then the ceremony of marriage itself, when you swore to love and to honor and to cherish your husband, that too was a lie? Yes. And when the police questioned you about this wretched man who believed himself married and loved, you told them. I told them what Leonard wanted me to say. You told them that he was at home with you at 25 minutes past nine, and now you say that that was a lie. Yes, a lie. And when you said that he had accidentally cut his wrist, again you lied. Yes. And now today you've told us a new story entirely. The question is, Frau Helm, were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or are you not, in fact, a chronic and habitual liar? <coughs> Casa, Casa, the other pill, under the tongue. My lord, is my learned friend to be allowed to bully and insult the witness in this fashion? Mr. Myers, this is a capital charge, and within the bounds of reason, I should like the defense to have every latitude. 
My lord, may I also remind my learned friend that his witness, by her own admission, has already violated so many oaths that I am surprised the testament did not leap from her hand when she was sworn here today. I doubt if anything is to be gained by questioning you any further. That will be all, Frau Helm. Mrs. Helm. You're making it a bit too obvious, you know. But you hate the very sight of me. The very sight of you, Anne, is perhaps the one thing about you I don't hate. Please, John, don't be so ill-mannered. Always fencing is a bit idiotic, isn't it? I am leaving in the morning. And I certainly wouldn't be here if I'd known you were going to be married. Credit me at least with some degree of tact. I do. You were always very tactful. Especially about my bad manners. <laughs> I never mentioned your manners. Incidentally, if you dislike me so intensely, why did you ever marry me in the first place? You want it reaffirmed after all these years? Does your vanity need it that much? I wanted you desperately. My craving for you was so violent I could deny you nothing. Not even a marriage that was bound to end in disaster. Why disaster? And it's a long way from a Pennsylvania steel town to Upper Park Avenue. Class distinction. You always claimed it never existed. Until I married you. And then I really found out how wrong I was. You see, Anne, my ideas of a wife were influenced by watching my mother ruin her health to bring up eight kids. Not that my demands on you would have been as high as that. But they would have included the proper running of a home and the bearing of children. About children. I did make it perfectly clear I know, clear I know. I the beautiful fashion model, that little hobby of yours. Your figure was too important to risk for posterity. I accepted the bargain. I have no complaints. But you have. You know you have, John. The same complaint as always. That I didn't love you when we got oh, married. please. Let's not go into that. Well, why would I have married you if I didn't love you? After all, there were others. More important, then. They couldn't pay you the full price. What price? Enslavement. <laughs> oh, John, really. How ridiculous you are. If all I wanted to do was make my husband a slave, why would I have chosen you and not the others? Because where would the fun have been? Now, I'm not here complaining about 20 of your brave men who beat three of my boys till they couldn't stand. Maybe they had it coming. Anyways, they're full growed and can take their lickings. And I'm not here complaining because I know that you're trying to buy the big muddy to keep my cows from water. Though it galls me sore to see the granddaughter of a genuine gentleman like Clem Marigan under this roof. I'll tell you why I'm here, Major Turrell. When you come a-riding roughshod over my land, scaring the kids and the women folks, when you invade my home like it was the law or God Almighty, then I say to you, I've seen every kind of critter God ever made. And I ain't never seen a meaner, lower, more stinking yellow hypocrite than you. Now, you can swallow up a lot of folks and make them like it, but you ain't swallowing me. I'm stuck in your craw, Henry Turrell, and you can't spit me out. You hear me now? You rode into my place and beat my men for the last time, and I give you warning. You set foot in Blanco Canyon once more, and this country's gonna run red with blood till there ain't one of us left. Now, I don't hold mine so precious, so if you want to start, here. Everything under control? Have I got things to tell you? What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. <laughs> what? Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. <laughs> What are you talking about? You can't marry Osgood. You think he's too old for me? Jerry, you can't be serious. Why not? He keeps marrying girls all the time. I am. But you're not a girl, you're a guy. And why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security. Jerry, you better lie down. You're not well. Will you stop treating me like a child? I'm not stupid. I know there's a problem. I'll say there is. His mother. We need her approval. But I'm not worried because I don't smoke. <laughs> Jerry, there's another problem. Like what? Like what are you going to do on your honeymoon? 
We've been discussing that. He wants to go to the Riviera, but I kind of lean towards Niagara Falls. <laughs> hey, how about some service, you stupid looking Irish pig? Hey, what's the matter with Torpedo room, report. Forward torpedo room. Take the car, I'm going to check. Double in now. All ahead, one third. All ahead, one third, sir. A hatch drum? Come to the dark shit off, Captain. Flesh and blood. Where's your missus? Uh, she run off with a drummer during prayer meeting. Where's she at? Down the river, Summers, Parkersburg, maybe a Cincinnati, one of them Sodoms of the Ohio River. She took them kids with her? Oh, heaven only knows what unholy sights and sounds them innocent little babes has heard in the dens of perdition where she dragged them. Right funny, ain't it? How they rode all the way up river in a ten foot John boat. Are they well, Miss Cooper? A sight better than they was. Gracious, gracious, you are a good woman, Miss Cooper. How are you figuring to raise them two without a woman? Oh, the Lord will provide. The Lord is merciful. Oh, what a day this is. And there's little John. What's wrong, John? Come to me, boy. What's wrong, John? Didn't you hear me, boy? John, when your dad says come, you should mind him. He ain't my dad. No, and he ain't no preacher, neither. Just march yourself yonder to your horse, mister. March, mister. I'm not fooling. All right. But you haven't heard the last of Harry Powell yet. The Lord God Jehovah will guide my hand in vengeance. You devils. You whores of Babylon. I'll be back when it's dark. 
Gentlemen of the court, there are times when I'm ashamed to be a member of the human race, and this is one such occasion. It's impossible for me to summarize the case for the defense since the court never allowed me a reasonable opportunity to present my case. Are you protesting the authenticity of this court? Yes, sir. I protest against being prevented from introducing evidence that I consider vital to the defense. The prosecution presented no witnesses. There has never been a written indictment of charges made against defendants. And lastly, I protest against the fact that no stenographic records of this trial have been kept. The attack yesterday morning is no stake on the honor of France. And certainly no disgrace to the fighting men of this nation. But this court martial is such a stake and such a disgrace. The case made against these men is a mockery of all human justice. Gentlemen of the court, to find these men guilty will be a crime to haunt each of you to the day you die. I can't believe that the noblest impulse of man, his compassion for another, can be completely dead here. Therefore, I humbly beg you, show mercy to these men. <laughs>